I'm a boss and I'm a boss and I'm a boss. And if I'm a boss, that means I'm gonna walk in here and I'm gonna be myself. And I don't care what you think about me walking in here being myself. I just had to step into that power. And one thing I know how to do is sell. I'll sell anything to anybody, anywhere. I'll sell this whole place to you right now. I'll sell you, I'll sell it with us sitting in here. That's what I will do. As I breathe, I sell. That's just what I am. My first six or seven months in real estate where I just could not make a dollar. I was so frustrated. <laughs> I was like, I'm really good and I'm not doing this well. It must be the system that's broken. I always share this story of talking to my mom like, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. And she's like, just give it another month, Trisha. <clears throat> I gave it another month. And that month was just, <laughs> that month was crazy. Mm. Everything came together that month. Every day I get up and fight for my clients, my business, my family my life. Every day I do it. And I don't want to do it sometimes, but every day I do it, you know? I don't have a choice because I know I want a good life. And I know that only me and only Trisha Lee can make that happen. Okay. So six months ago, I shared on this channel that I had this crazy goal of hitting 100,000 subscribers. Well, it's not as crazy as I thought. At the time when I said that, we had 3,000 subscribers. And we're so close right now to hitting 100,000. So please help us out with this goal, this crazy dream that I had. Hit that subscribe button. And here's what I can promise you if you do. We're going to take this podcast to another level. We're going to continue to scale the production, the guests, every little part of what we do. But I can't do it without your help. So please subscribe. Thank you for listening. And on to the show. You're one of the top real estate brokers in New York City. Uh, you've sold over $300 million of real estate in an eight-year career, which is insane. Um... And of course you have this new Netflix show coming out, uh, Owning Manhattan. And so I've just shared a few of the accolades, a few of the things that you've done, but I wanted to get it in your words. And so if someone has just stumbled on this video, they've just clicked on this video mm -hmm. and they have no awareness of who Trisha Lee is, how would you explain it to them? Who is Trisha Lee? Mm, that's a great question badass boss bitch that can do anything. I don't know. <laughs> like, no, I think I am just someone that's ever evolving. You know, I think that's, that's kind of like, maybe that's my purpose. I'm not sure, but I think I'm, I'm somebody that, um, that changes things quite often. And so I'm in a season right now where I'm definitely seeing a lot of the things I've learned in my different careers and experiences come together in a way that really benefits me and makes sense. And I'm like, I feel like I'm looking at it from the top and like, oh, okay, that's why all those things had to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great place to be. Um, you guys are seeing that, and I think that's how people are going to meet me. But the the way in which I got there is is the true story. Um, I am a broker. I'm, I love real estate. I love um, I love the city that I live in, and I love selling the city that I live in. And the show is just something that documents that. You know, it's it's um it's about the brokerage that I work with, which is Sirhant, and I work with Ryan Sirhant, and the show will share those stories. Um, but all that stuff has been going on before the show for eight mm -hmm. years. It's been eight years of my life that I've been in this career full time, fully focused. Um, and it's kind of like all these things were already in place. Now you'll just, now you'll see it, you know, that that's really what it is. But um, definitely lean more towards business than anything else. I always kind of want to know how business works and how things make make sense and how, the, how to scale them. Um, I just happen to have a, a love for things that are beautiful. And so it was an easy transition to go from beauty into real estate because real estate is beautiful. New York real estate is the most beautiful, you know? So um, I'm still selling beauty, if you think about it. Mm. You know, that's what I do. That's my job. Mm. Yeah. I like that. I like the way that you put that. And you know what? We're going we're gonna to get deeper into the story. We're going to get deeper into the real estate and, and the come <laughs> up there. But to begin... I really wanted to kind of get a sense of your early context. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in order to kind of really understand someone and why they are the way they are, yeah. you need to understand those kind of formative years, those childhood years. Yeah. And for you, I know it's very different um, than where you are now in New York. And so give people that context of how you grew up and, and, and that so they can really understand you. Yeah. Well, I think my story is... It's unique in some ways and then very similar to a lot of other people's stories. But I was born in New York. I grew up in Arizona. Um, when my parents were separated, I grew up with my mom in Arizona. And I grew up in a very single mom-parent home. Um, and so I, my example to adulthood was like a woman navigating having children, 
a career and doing and being all of those things to everyone. And, you know, and I was always at school on time. I always looked great. Um, homework was always done. I was always prepared. And it was just her. And she was managing a huge house, and she was managing her children, and she was managing her career, and she was fly. <laughs> and she was, that's just all I've ever seen, you know? And it's probably a lot, and it's probably twice as much as the next parent was managing, but that was, that was my example, and that was the only example I ever saw. Um, and maybe that is what kind of shaped my mind around what is normal, mm. you know? Um, we had we were very routine, you know. It wasn't a strict house, but it was very much about routine and discipline. We we had our passions. I loved to dance. My sister loved art, and we were both pushed to pursue those to the best of our ability. I spent all of my time dancing because I loved it, mm -hmm. and I loved the freedom in it. I loved the expression in it. I loved the power that I felt like I had in it because I could work really hard and get really good and just do better than everyone else if I put my all into it, and I love that. So I danced all the time when I was younger, and um, I love that my mom recognized that, oh, she loves this, let her do it as much as she wants to do it, you know, let her enjoy that. It was like my childhood. Um, <clears throat> and then I think I learned a lot from her because when she divorced my dad, I think she had to become very independent. And so as I'm, you know, six and seven, eight years old, I'm watching her be this super independent person. And I think that that's just who she is. I think actually she was becoming that. And I would watch how she would go through the most mundane tasks and figure it out. So she was very much about learning how her home worked and how to fix things in her home and how to improve her home. And like, so we did a lot of things that people with two pa family, two parents did, but we just did it with our single mom. Mm -hmm. um, but she never wanted to feel like we had less or did less. And so it was always about providing for us the same way two parents would. I think she put that burden and that responsibility on herself. But that's what she taught me. She taught me that with or without a partner, you still have to be and do all the things you, you want to be and do. Hmm. Like there should be nothing less on the table because there's only you. Like, you know, and that's a lot for someone to, to manage. But she managed it and she managed it really well. And I guess I learned it from her, you know. I learned to be independent, resourceful, figure it out, read it again, look at it one more time. How does it work? It's yours now. You should know how it works. You should know how to maintain it. You should know how to fix it. You know, and um, that way of looking at things just kind of created that personality of like, I want to know and understand the things I'm involved in. I kind of want to control them a little bit, and I'm working on that. <laughs> but it's it's it develops the personality, you know what I mean? Because it's like you have to learn. I mean, I remember everything we got as kids. It was like, well, make sure you know how to take care of it. So that was just what it was, you know, like that's how we functioned. Like if you want... Christmas lights, you've got to put them up on the house. And so you got to get on the ladder. You've got to put them up on the house because there's nobody here to do that but you guys. Mm. And so you, you figure out how to be super duper independent. And then now as an adult, you try to not apologize for that because it's just who you are. Mm. And it's what you've had to be to get here, you know. Mm. And you hope to gravitate towards people that are not threatened by it and upset about it, you know, because it's really a great, it's a really great gift to be resourceful and independent and not feel like a victim all the time. Just feel like that shit got to get done. Let me do it. Let mm. me at least try, mm. you know, mm. and spend energy there versus, hmm, why is it, you know, it's, yeah. that's not like, I just feel like I was always taught whatever you got, work with it. Mm. You know? You know what? I think, um, I've realized this as I got older, great parents are really, they're like superheroes. And the, the reason I say that is when you're a child, we're not really aware of everything that's going on or even the fact that it's unique or different. Yeah. And so um, I grew up with a single mom for the first 10 years of my life. Mm. And there were certain things that she was doing that only in hindsight did I understand how gargantuan of an effort it was, how special it was mm -hmm. that she, she held that up. And so I'm, I'm curious for you, like, What's an experience where, in hindsight, it's obvious to you that, like, that was crazy that she was able to do that. Yeah. But in the moment, it was just normal. It was just standard. It was just the routine. It was the everyday. But looking back at Trisha Lee at the age that you are now, it's like, man, that was special that she did that. Yeah. I mean, there's so many because my mom was, like, such a just 
quiet badass. You know, like she doesn't know what a badass she was. She still doesn't know what what a badass she is. Like she's always like, I'm just so impressed by. It. I'm like, you taught me that. What are you talking about? Like you you don't remember? Like you know, it's like it's she has no idea her power. It's it's really crazy. But um, I would say my first lesson or the first time I realized um, how strong she was was like. We had moved into a new house, and it was a really, really nice house. And she was so proud of this house that she had bought. And it was beautiful, and it was equipped with everything. And I think that maybe the people that had it were losing it or something, but it was, like, overdone. The house was, like, insane. And I think they were losing it, and somehow she was able – maybe it was a short seller or something because – it was completely customed and kitted out and it had every feature you could imagine. And she's buying this house, and we're moving into this house, we don't know how to use anything. And every time something would break, my mom would like go to the library and like get a catalog or get a book or get a get something and learn how to fix it. And so like it was very common to be like, Okay, we're gonna fix the garbage disposal, come downstairs. I'm like, what do you mean? We don't we don't fix garbage disposal. You know, we're gonna fix it today because it's broken, you know. So we had to learn how to fix like the garbage compactor, the intercom, like all these features of the home. If the garage broke, like we had to learn how to care for or repair the things that were ours. And it was like, I can afford this, I can't afford the maintenance of it. So we have to learn how to do that on our own. Um I think that was one of the early, early lessons of just figuring it out, just figure things out. And so I know that, like, for me now in my life, I'm very solutions oriented. It's like it's going to be about 35 seconds to bitch about the problem, and then we're going to, like, be trying to figure this thing out and close this up. Mm. And I know that that comes from just that was the way that things were handled. That's just how we went about things. It was like, okay. All we have is each other, but we are going to find the resources, ask the questions, talk to the neighbors, and figure out how to resolve X. Because X is going to get resolved. Like, that was just how things were. So I think it was a very early lesson about what I learned from her about who I wanted to be. Mm. You know, and I think in completely opposite of that, I know that some of the things that she learned from me as a very young child was nobody's going to tell me no. Mm. You know, like her and I always talk about lessons that we learn from each other because I think as much as I was learning from my mom in a lot of ways she was learning from me because my personality is, I've been this person my whole life. You know, anyone that knows me will tell you that. Like, that's Trisha. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she don't mean nothing though, but that's who she is. <laughs> and, um, you know, early on, I think as a child, I was like, Oh, you know, like I remember like with dance, for example, I love to dance. I love to dance. All I want to do is dance. didn't want to do anything else. And she puts me in a dance class. And I'm like, oh, mommy, I just love it. That's all I want to do. That's all I want to do. And she's like, okay. She's like, well, I can do two classes a week. That's what I can do. And I was like, two classes a week? No, girl, I want to do two classes a day. <laughs> and she's like, Trisha, nobody, nobody's paying for you to come here and do two classes a day. And I was like, well, how are we going to work this out? Like, I just was like, I need to work this out. Like, I need to be here every day. And she's mm. like, that's not a thing. And then it was a thing because I went to the dance studio director and I asked if there was anything I could do around the studio. I was 12 years old. You got any job I can do around here? And she's like, job? You're 12. And I was like, I mean, I'm really good with money. I don't, you know, because I, I was learning from my mom, like, how to pay bills and how to, like, manage the checkbook and how to, like, balance the budget for the month. And I was really good at those types of things. Like, that, whether I was good or not, I was forced to learn, right? And then I got really good at it. So at 12 years old, I kind of had money management, cash management experience that I should not have had at 12 years old, let's be clear. Um, but I was like, I can work here. I can do something. I can sweep up. I can do whatever. And at 12 years old, I got my first job, like, working at the dance studio. But it supported my dance life. And it allowed me the freedom to dance six to seven days a week as much as I wanted to. So at 12 years old, I was supporting what I wanted to do because she told me no. And I told myself yes. And I remember her being like, this kid, god damn it. You know? And she was just like, well, I told her she had to figure it out if she wanted it. She figured it out least I could do is support her so she kind of helped with the carpooling to get me and the other dance like they would take turns because the studio was nowhere near our house and like who's going to take this huge carve of time out of their day to get you guys to dance class and I was like don't worry I'll coordinate it and I coordinated with all the parents and like my mom had Thursdays and so I worked out paying for all these dance classes that were insanely expensive and I worked out a way to transport 
me and all my dance friends around that wasn't going to burden our parents too much. Like my mom had to do it once a day, but everyone's mom had to do it once a day or parent had to do it once, once a week. So my mom had a day and then Michelle's mom had a day and, you know, Bridget's mom had, everyone had, everyone had a day. And that is just, you know, that's what I was doing at 12. Like, so yeah, you know, that's just who you, I think you're, you are who you are and just experiences bring more of that out of you. And mm. I think that's like one of my early lessons of who I was. And she always reflects back to that. Like, you know, again, in that moment, you're teaching me, you're, you're teaching me perseverance. You're teaching me solutions. You're teaching me how to get what you want creatively, you know? And that was it. It was like, I can work here. I would like leave school at three o'clock and go work my little job. Mm. <laughs> and I'd work for like three hours, which was enough money to take like two classes. And then I'd take my two classes and I'd go home, rinse and repeat. And that's what I did. And I did that every day, every single day, every day for years. And I loved it. And I loved it. And I loved it. And it's just something that we could not do, but we figured it out. Hmm. She told me no, but I told myself yes. I was like, I need to be here every day. I don't know what you're talking about. I love it here and I never want to go home. Like, I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. And when the music would come on and be loud, I just felt so free. And that's all I wanted to do. And I just had to figure it out. I was like, I hear you, but no, <laughs> I'll be back, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah, I got me a job and it was great because it taught me cash management. It taught me how to like run a front desk. You know what I mean? I was like 12 years old, be like, hey, Kalem, great to see you. Listen, you have a little balance at the front. <laughs> you owe us $13, <laughs> you know? And that was my little management experience. And I write my little receipts out. And, you know, I was proud to clean the windows of the studio and the place looked good. And I'd walk around and I was proud that the bathroom was clean. And, the, the, you know, I it was like mine. I took ownership of it. Mm. And I'm 12 years old and this is my studio and it smells great in here and it looks great in here and everything all these books are up to date and I was literally learning bookkeeping at 12 years old and it was completely illegal for me to have that job but I was happy the director was everybody was happy with the arrangement you know and it's like the best job I ever had till this day you know because mm. it was like I get to just hang out here with all these amazing dancers and I get to become an amazing dancer for free mm. it was wonderful yeah you know these these experiences in our childhood they leave like footprints on us right and yeah. I think the point uh, even for me personally the point that I'm at now um I have deep gratitude for it because mm. it it kind of built the character it built who I am but I'm also aware there were certain moments that I remember vividly that it was deeply frustrating to me growing up the fact that my parents weren't together or like the dynamic of mm. my family yeah the fact that it was the way it is and I can tell from you it's like that resourcefulness is there like it's mm -hmm. um you can see the effect of that of yeah. those experiences in who you are now but i'm curious the other side is there moments are there moments when you reflect on kind of your childhood where it was like there were points that you were like deeply frustrated or That's annoyed at the dynamic yeah. or this is unfair or why am i not like these other kids or yeah like sure. what, explain some of that. I think that was half of it. Like half the time it was that and half the time it was perseverance. I think, I think definitely like, I don't remember. Well, actually that's not true. I do remember one family where their dad wasn't in the picture, but that was not normal. And that was not anyone else's story. Like I remember one family that was their story. Um, and that was frustrating. And that was frustrating to just feel like, I remember my mom being sick one time and I was like, Oh, she gets sick? Because it never dawned on me that she got sick because she never showed that she got sick. And I was like 15 when she got sick. And I was like, you get sick? That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't get sick. You wake us up at 7 every morning. And we do this routine and that's what we do. You know, and on the weekends I go to dance. She goes to art classes and then we just do our routine. And we're on church on Sundays. And like, you're always fine every day. Only we get sick. And she was mm -hmm. sick and I was totally freaked out that she got sick. It was like a cold, but I just couldn't deal with it. You know, because that's how strong she was you know it's just mm. insane but I remember feeling like you know why can't my dad be here or why can't I have a better parent dynamic you know um, especially when you're seeing such healthy normal ones every day you know it took time and growth to realize that wasn't the case mm. <laughs> but that was the comparison game always feeling like why is this my hand? Like, this is what I'm supposed to play with? Come on. Like, I don't want to play with this. This is not even a hand, you know? Um, that was just a part of the disappointment, I think. Um, but there was just always a little something in me that never wanted to be a victim. And I never wanted my lack of having a head start 
to impact my results. Because mm. I felt like that would make me a victim. Like, well, I couldn't get here because I didn't have a car. I just wanted to get there at 10 o'clock like you, even if I had to walk. Like, that was, I don't know. That was just a standard I held myself to. I didn't want, I didn't want my, my hand to be a part of the conversation. I wanted my results to be the conversation. So I would diminish a lot of things that were disappointing, and I would focus on what I could do, what I could get done. And it just created that a routine, I think, to get, to get things done. And it's, it's like that in every area of my life. Like I, I get very weird when people are like, oh, you, you, know, you have all these things. I work my ass off for everything you see, every single thing, everything. Everything you don't see, I work my ass off for. Mm. Um, I may not look like it. I mean, I act like it. I mean, I walk in here like, oh, Lord, geez, I have two, you know, but I had two and a half hours of sleep last night. It doesn't matter. I still have to be here and do this and look the way I have to look. But I absolutely mm. had two and a half hours of sleep last night. So that's the standard I hold myself to. I don't want to inconvenience you with my nonsense. Mm. I just don't, you know? I just want to deal with my nonsense and I want to get my results. And Maybe that's what I learned from her, I guess, you know, like I'm 15 before I see that she's sick. You never get to catch a cold. I'm sure she caught a cold at some point or another, <laughs> you mm. know, but nothing ever changed because she caught a cold or was sick or was having a bad day or having a headache or depressed or whatever. She did what she had to do every day. And maybe that's just what we were taught. We were never taught to ignore our feelings. We were never taught not to accept our feelings, but we were definitely taught shit had to get done. You know, and so it just creates this belief in your ability to push through. Now, if I get to the other side, I'm going to tell you, listen, I had two and a half hours of sleep yesterday. This is why my eyebrows are on crooked or whatever. <laughs> but I'm not going to come here an hour late. I'm not going to come here not dressed. I'm not going to come here not prepared. You know, that's not fair. And that's not a good representation of who I am either. You know, I, I got to get shit done. Mm. That's my truth. And maybe we'll talk later about what it took to get it done, mm. you know? Um, so I think those lessons were weaved into every day and every moment of my life because I had the best example, and then I just followed that. It wasn't – it was all I ever saw. I didn't have anything else to follow. Mm. It yeah. sounds like it drove you. It's like the environment, the environment or external circumstances will not determine the result. No, no, and – Sometimes the environment and the external, external circumstances piss you off to such a point that it lights a fire. You know, it's like, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show me. Hmm. Sometimes it's that, I think, too. Just kind of like, this is so not fair. I can't wait to kill this shit and show them. I can't. I can't wait, you know? Mm. If that's what it takes to get there, do, use, lean into that, I think, you know? And sometimes it's just like, can I do this? Let me see. Let me just try my best, you know, like whatever. But no, you just got to get it done. What do they say? Hell or high water? That, that's mm, just got to get it high done. Water. Yeah. Like that, that's always it. And um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's something I need to unpack it with my therapist. Like, why don't you ever want to be a victim? I just never want to be a victim. You know what I mean? Like nobody cares if you're the only black girl in the class. Mm. Was your speech good? Did you get an A? Were you on time? Mm. You know, did you stand out? Did you stand above? Did you show out? Like, that's, that's what we're here to do. Like, you know, and, and someone else that appears to have a much easier day or a much easier way of getting there, that's probably not the truth either. Like, we all are dealing with whatever we're dealing with. But I do want to always show up and just do the best I can. Hmm. I feel good about that. I always feel good about that, you know? Hmm. And so I think that's, that's what I'm driven to do in every situation. And I think I've always been driven to do that in every situation. Like, just leave it better. Just do, just, just leave it better. Make a good contribution. It could be anything. We could plan a brunch, and I want to make a good, I want to make a great contribution to the brunch. I want the brunch to be better because Trisha Lee was involved. Period. I think mm. that's fair. I think that's a fair expectation of myself. Mm. You know, I want to read out a quote that you said. I was listening to an interview that you were in. You said, "Being plucked out of New York and thrown into Arizona, where you are a one to two percent minority, everyone is evaluating you, and half of them are hating you, and the other half are confused by you." Mm -hmm. everyone is clear and so are you that you don't really fit in right it's either going to make you shrink or it's going to make you outperform and outgrow yeah and you don't I have another choice there, is there a third one i don't know because you're other in every way and you're hated you mm -hmm. know like 
I was hated. Um, I was hated a lot, you know, for different reasons. Uh, what makes you say that? Is there any experience that comes to mind that like you had that realization, like you had that feeling of like, I'm not meant to be here. Okay, so quick break. One of the things that I've learned from doing this episode is the importance and the impact of your environment. Who are the people around you? Your network is your net worth. And so the sponsor of today's episode is going to help you up level uh, the network and the people around you. So the sponsor of today's episode is Wealth Weekend. This is a conference from July 26th to July 28th. It's being held in Atlanta. And it's actually the guest. So George Achimpong and his business partner Carter Cofield are putting on this event that features a number of seven-figure entrepreneurs explaining exactly how they built their business. And when I was talking to George about it, one of the things that he really pushed was the networking piece. The ability to not only listen to these people, but also get to meet them and get to meet other like-minded people that are trying to build successful businesses and overall successful lives from themselves. Even just looking at some of the expertise of the speakers, you have top content creators, you have personal finance experts, you have people that understand the stock market and investing, real estate. There's literally so many different fields. And so if you're looking to take your income, your network to a whole nother level, this is definitely something that you should check out. And it gets even better because I've hooked you guys up. When you use the link in the description and you use the code WEALTH, you will get 20% off your event ticket. So go to the link in the description, use that code WEALTH, and you'll get 20% off your ticket. Uh, thank me later. It's going to be an incredible weekend in Atlanta. And let's get back to the show. Yeah, like I, I was dealing with a lot of people who had really, really racist parents, and so they had really racist tendencies. This is Arizona, <laughs> you mm. know? Um there was the colorism thing. I was really dark skin. I'm still, I mean, I don't know if I'm dark skin, but I think I'm dark skin. People don't think I'm dark skin, but I was dark skin in Arizona and I was dark skin growing up and I was teased about it every day. Um, and just being black, they tease you, you know, like being skinny, they tease, they wanna tease you for anything. Your hair is short, they tease you. Your hair is long, they tease you, whatever. Your teeth are big, your teeth are small, they tease you. Um, but that built like, that built like a toughness very early on very early on. So I didn't get very far in my life before I was like, I will not be bullied. I'll be, I'll bully before I get bullied. I know that much, you know? So it was just my way. I don't remember, I don't remember a time not standing up for myself. I just don't. I probably always have, but I always had to, right? I always had to. And I also kind of always felt like y'all ain't shit. Mm. <laughs> you know, I go home to a mother that pours love into me every day, that wakes me up telling me how beautiful and smart I am. I don't care nothing about what y'all think. I know who I am. So that was true then. It's true now. That's just what it is. Um, I hate that you don't like me, but I'll sleep tonight. You know, um, that was growing up at that time in Arizona. And I said this at 20. I said it at 30. I say it now. Like, it probably set me up for life better because I didn't rely on that to feel good about myself or be happy because it was never offered to me. You know, it just is not a thing. I think so many black women can relate to that, especially black women in tight spaces doing amazing things, you know? Um, it probably was necessary. I never, I never got stuck on it though. I never got stuck on it. And I think I never got stuck on it because I figured out a way to stand up for myself and I also figured out a way to outperform. I still had great grades. I danced my ass off. I danced my ass off every day. And I worked hard to be a great dancer. And I worked hard to get great grades. And I worked hard to keep my room really clean because I liked it clean. It wasn't an expectation. I liked it that way. And I worked really, really hard to, you know, become president of my class or to be the best cheerleader. Whatever I wanted to do, I worked really, really hard at. And that felt so good. I don't think I could, I don't think there was space to worry about what, what you thought, you know? And then 
you grow up and you you continue to let that lead your life, you know, and then you become a better version of yourself, a better version of yourself, a better version of yourself, you know, and I, I think I'm at a point in my life now where I'm just unstoppable. Mm-hmm. And I laugh at people that were mean to me or hated me or whatever. Not, not like I was bullied by any means. I'm not going to say that that was a thing because that just is not a thing. You know, you pop shit to me, I'm popping shit right back to you. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, guess what? You know, (laughs) that has always been me. Like, I used to always get in trouble for that. I was always in trouble in school for, like, Trisha, you're the president of the class. You can't be talking like that. I'm like, but she (laughs) said it first, you know? Like, I'm always going to stand up for myself. Yeah. But um, I think that even at that time, I was like, this is all making sense. Because I'm learning to persevere in an environment where nobody wants to see me win. You know, and then they start to want to see you in and they start to think you're dope and then they start to co-sign what you do. And it still doesn't matter because you didn't care to begin with. So now that you love it, guess what? It still doesn't matter. It, it, it can't it can't matter. Hmm. We wouldn't we would have never done it if it was based on what you thought, you know. So it's like I think at a young age, I figured out that these like unique circumstances were shaping me. I, I definitely know, I, I definitely knew that that was important. Mm. Like, and I would, I remember being in college and I had certain friends and they would clam up around their professors or they'd clam up around study groups because they had never been exposed to being like perhaps the only one, the only minority, the only woman, the only black woman, the only black person. And I'm in a room full of 300 students. I'm the only black person. So it's like, am I not going to, do what I need to do and shine in this moment because I, fuck these people. I got to do what I got to do. Let's get this done. Hmm. And that was just what I learned early. And that's what I had to be and do. It's just what I had to be and do. And I, and I'm still in that position now. There are agents that are out here doing $300 million in a month. Hmm. You know what I mean? But that's nothing to do with me. I got to do what I'm supposed to do. That's it. I got to focus on me and that's it. And I got to grow and I got to get better and it's just not a comparison game. It's just not. It's just about my objectives, my goals, and what I need to do. Yeah. You know, I think, I think to the example that you gave of being, like, in a room of 300 people and you're the only one. Can you imagine in a botany class and, like, or chemistry class and you're in a stadium-style seating class and at Arizona State University, you don't see another brown face in the room. Maybe mm. a Mexican guy over there in the corner. It's 300 of us in the room, you know? It's like... Yeah. But I was so used to it by then. You know, at 18, it didn't matter. I was so used to it by then. Sad, but I was so, I was so accustomed to it by then. You know, yeah, and one of, the, one of the things, you even said it in this quote, you said, uh, it's either going to make you shrink or you're going to outperform. Yeah, you and have I, to decide. I think about that because I think there's so many people, I think the vast majority of people, it, they just want to fit in and they feel that they almost have to dim themselves. They have to like mm-hmm. dim their light. Yeah. They have to shrink so that they don't, I don't cause too much of a stir, not too much attention. Yeah. Not everyone looking at me, the only one. Yeah. And it's like you build this, this perception in your mind. And so. Assimilate, I, assimilate. I tried that. I tried that for a long time and it just didn't work. Mm. It didn't work at all. It just was never, it was never my personality. It was never a good fit. What would you say to that person? That's kind of, they're in that struggle of like, they're the only one. And there's this constant fight between. Do I outperform and, and stand out or do I just kind of fit into the group? Always just do your very best. Always just put the very best version of yourself out there. Always. It has nothing to do with what anybody else is doing. It doesn't have to fit in. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to be agreeable. Always do that because these people will never matter. You know what I mean? If I had conformed to what made sense in junior high, those people couldn't even get me to answer my phone today. Mm. I said it here because I meant it. You know, same with high school. Half of that's true for college. Like, you're not going to matter in the big scheme of things. So I can't allow you to weigh into, weigh too heavily now. Like, this is my life, my journey, my experience. And I don't know how you get to a point where you have to put that to the side, but it's imperative that you get there as quick as possible. Because you don't do yourself any justice by diminishing who you are. You know what I mean? Like, and you don't have to be obnoxious. And you don't have to be unbearable, but you do have to be yourself. You have to truly, truly be yourself 
And you have to get comfortable with that. And I think it's a beautiful thing. We all see people that are truly comfortable with themselves. I, I walk around New York all the time. And I'm like, God damn, he loves himself. Look, look at this one. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I just get so much energy from that. And I think that's why I love New York so much. Because I always felt when I moved here, I remember like being in Times Square and I saw the, like, the cowboy in his underwear with the guitar mm. or whatever. And I was like, like, I was very young. And I was just like, this man's out here in his drawers playing a guitar and with a cowboy hat on in Times Square and nobody cares. Like no one cares. And I love that. I love the idea of that because it's like everyone's experience is uniquely theirs. And it's okay. It's fine. You know mm. what I mean? And like... I don't believe that me judging him with that cowboy hat and his drawers on had anything to do with his day. I don't think it mattered at all, mm. you know? And now, 20 years later, I look back at, like, how bold and badass that was, that you'd come out here in your drawers and a cowboy hat. <laughs> so I, I, I think it's imperative to figure out a way, especially for the youth, to get to that point early. And it doesn't mean... Um, it doesn't mean not to care. It just means like to not be driven by what people think. That's all. Like just to just to do the best you can and be the best you can, mm. and just worry about your own journey. You know, you, you you mentioned that there was like you felt it at different points of your life, like this pressure to assimilate to fit in. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, like when I say this, what is the first moment that comes to mind? Which is you just made almost that bet that. Um, that promise to yourself, like, no, I'm going to be Trisha. Like, mm -hmm. what is that experience? What is that story that comes to mind where you made that kind of, it was just that confidence of like, no, this is me. Like, I'm going to just stand on that, nothing else. I think um, a lot of experiences remind me of that. But my freshman year, I went to a new high school and I really wanted to be president of the class. And it was, I think it was 2% minority. The only black faculty I remember was the security, the head of security. I think it was Mr. Smith was his name. And um, I wanted to be the president of the class. I love student government. I always love student government. I want to be the president of the class. And I'm new and I'm a freshman. I don't know anyone. Like I know a couple of people from like my eighth grade year, but I don't know anybody. Like how am I going to become the president of the class? And I was just like, I'm going to campaign and I'm going to market myself. And I'm just going to, you know, I didn't have the words then, but that's what I did. And so I... I remember creating buttons and I remember like going around and speaking to different classes and like why they should vote for me. And I remember spending my lunch hours like running, like I had a, cam a solid campaign. I was like, I did my thing. And then the night before the camp, the, the vote, I stayed up all night making maybe like 400 cupcakes. And I was like, if I haven't gotten them to vote for me now, I'm going to get them to vote for me today. <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed. I don't know if it was my mom or my sister, but someone got roped into it. And I made 400 cupcakes, and I brought them to the school the next day in the back of my mom's car. And I was like, I'm going to buy their vote if I can't get their vote. <laughs> and so I passed out cupcakes during the voting day. And I won, and I was president of the class. And then once you're president of the class, it's easier to be president of the next class, the next class, the next class. But that was that was what I did. And I I don't know why I would stay up all night baking 400 cupcakes with one oven, but that's what I did. Because I was like, I got to win this thing. Hmm. That's what I know. And I've always been that way. Like when I opened my business in Clinton Hill, I don't think I slept for a week that last week. It was literally like 72 hours of, a day of work to get that business open on time for the opening procession like everything we you know we had the mayor it was a whole moment but it was like if there were 24 hours in the day we had 75 hours worth of work to do but it got done mm. and when you saw that grand opening it was unlike anything they'd ever seen it was mm. wonderful people still talk about it till this day mm. you know but it's like it had to be done meticulously in that way regardless of like it doesn't matter where we're starting from. It needs to be done. It needs to be done expertly. And it was. And it was beautiful. And it was well-received. And it was super-duper successful with the few little resources we had to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, really proud of that. You know? Mm. So I'm really, really proud of the things I've been able to accomplish with the shitty hand I've been dealt. Mm. You know? And maybe that's why you can't talk shit to me. Maybe that's the reason why I'm who I am. Because only I know the truth. And only I know... I know how I got here. Mm. You're not going to make me feel like I don't belong here. Mm. It's this like, it's this will to outperform. And, and you know what, I'm, you, you alluded to it, but 
give people the the context because we're, we're going to get onto the real estate stuff and, and all the success and, and what you've done there. But even if we just took your career before you ever sold a single property in real estate, it was an incredibly successful career. And so for people that might not know, give them, give them that context. Yeah. So I had been working at Mac Cosmetics as my first little New York job. All I wanted to do was work at Mac. And I, I love the business so much. I really wanted, I really wanted my own business. And so while I was working there, I started putting together a business model of a nail bar that was going to be super chic, um, upscale, trendy, fun, all the things that we see in nail salons now, but that wasn't a thing then. Hmm. And I wanted that. Uh, I wanted to create that. And I thought that, well, I thought I would love it. So I think if I love it, there's other women that would love it. So I was like, and again, it's just like, even with owning Manhattan, I feel like there's a lot of women like me. They'll want to see me because I want to see me, you know? So it was the same with Polish Bar. It was just like, if I would love this, why wouldn't a lot of women just like me love it? Or a lot of people just like me love it? Um, I just thought it could work. So I started working on the business plan and... Um, I got to a point where I was prepared financially, mentally, whatever. I was just prepared to do it, and I and I did it. And I, you know, con I consulted with a few people, decided to give a thirty day notice and leave my career, and leave my job, not career, my job, leave my job, and um, do my own thing. And I think a lot of people that I was working with at that time had been in the company for eight years, nine years, nine years. I think they thought I was crazy. Like, why would you leave this good, good job with these great benefits? Are you crazy? You know what I mean? Like, and I had great benefits, by the way, because I'd been at the company since I was, like, in college. Um, and, like, the parent company for Mac um, I had been working for since I was maybe 19 or 18. So I was cushy. I was comfortable. I was comfortable for what I think most people desire to be comfortable with. Um, and I really wanted to open my business, so I did. And, we, and I started, and we started that process, and I found a location, and I did a build out and I did renovations and I did all those things. I had never done any of those things before. Like I just, you know, I, it was all new, but I did it. And I put together um, just a marketing plan that I, I guess that, that would resonate with me, you know, and I wanted people to understand the difference in the business and how we were uniquely different. And I just put it out there and all the things that were in my head, I put down on paper and I executed and I had great support, great help, people that loved me in my life that just showed up and, all hands on deck situation and we opened and we opened to an extremely successful grand opening, an extremely successful first year. You know, within six months we needed another location and we, I didn't have any time to look for anything like that, but we needed it. And so we started that process. And um, within a year and a half, I had two locations, maybe like 18, 18 staff, I think, techs and techs, makeup artists, whatever. <clears throat> and then I continued to do that for the next eight and a half years, just running that, running those businesses and pushing that brand forward and making that. Um, I just wanted it to be where all the hot chicks went. I was like, I want all the hot chicks to come to my salon, you know, mm -hmm. and because they were and they were they were so beautiful and they were so fashionable. And I was like, I love this. And I was like, this should be our thing. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, how do we get more influential women? Because I didn't know at the time that I was dealing with influencers. I just knew that these women were fabulous. Mm. You know, and I was like, I want more fabulous women like that to come to my salon. I want to be the place where all the fabulous women go to. And it's, I think it's okay to say that and do that. And that's just what it, be, it became. And so it was like, I would say five years in, like, there was definitely like, there were salons and then there was Polish Bar. And a woman wanted to tell you she was a Polish Bar client. Mm. Till this day, yesterday, actually a podcast I did this morning, a woman was telling me that. <laughs> so that was, that was it. And, um. You know, I'm out of that business and I'm stepped away from it completely, but I'm super duper proud that I created such a movement and such like a, such a motion that other businesses came behind that business and duplicated that formula to a T. Mm. Well, not to a T, only I can do it to a T, but <laughs> <laughs> to like an S. <laughs> Definitely to an S. <laughs> um, and it was just cool. And, it, and, it, and overall, it created a higher caliber of beauty services in my communities because this was Clinton Hill and Prospect Heights, Fort Greene. And so that just became the standard. And more than I'm proud of the business, because I don't think about the business ever, but I'm super proud that 
creating a better service for women and women in these neighborhoods became the standard. It was no longer acceptable to throw together these salons where people are like eating over your feet while they're doing your pedicure. No, you're going to come in, you're going to be treated with customer service, you're going to be booked properly, this is going to go into your calendar, you're going to be marketed properly, you're going to, this business is branded, there's promotional events, there's community outreach, there's purpose, there's service, there's mission, you know, whatever it was. There are things that we support, there are things we don't support. Um, and it made that impact. It made that impact. The week I closed, we were on GMA. I remember CNN interviewing the community at my business the night Obama went into office um, because that's who we were in the community. And I'm proud of that more than anything related to the beauty. I'm proud that we were so small and so loud. Mm. And that's very important to me, to be small and loud, <laughs> mm. you know? Because mm. it doesn't matter if I don't have what you have. I want to be just as impactful as you are. Hmm. that's just always going to be weaved into everything, I think. Because I think I got so stuck on that hand for so long, like, why is this my hand? Hmm. That I learned to be like, Does, that, that can't matter. Hmm. Let's get these results. It goes back to the outperforming. Um, you know what, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm curious to understand the motivation with that because, and to give people the context, you're working at Mac, which is like an extremely, um, respected desirable job you're earning a really good salary you have the great benefits that you mentioned mm -hmm. um why do you even make the decision to leave that all behind to start something by yourself and it's also it's not just something by yourself it's also where you're starting it on mm -hmm. Myrtle Avenue it's not seen as a neighborhood which is like trendy right maybe today it is but at that point, it wasn't. Yeah. And so people that their career is set up in this way and they're already achieving this success, they don't usually want to quit and start again and do something else. Yeah. And so what, what, what was motivating you? Well, I always wanted to work for myself because I like to be in charge of my own schedule and my own day and my own time. I want to be the one that says yes and no. So I always wanted that. I know that's because I watched my mom do that routine for so many years that she had to do, regardless of how she felt, if she was sick, if she could be allowed to be sick. And I know that I wanted to have far more flexibility and control. And so I knew that entrepreneurism was that way. And so it wasn't, was I going to own a business? It was when I was going to own a business. I looked at my time as Ma at Mac, Estee Lauder, if you will, as a time to learn how to run a business. It was a job I did, and I did it to the best of my ability, and I loved it, and I only talked about it, and I only cared about it. But I also was take, it was a master's program in business is really what it was. I was learning about how to run a business at a time where Mac was the biggest beauty business in the world. Not now. It's the equivalent of, of going around opening up Sephora stores at, as Sephora is becoming Sephora, and... There's nothing you won't learn. And then I was doing it in New York. So I was in the top market and the top company in the country in beauty. And as they learned things through trial and error, I was learning those things. So I was on the front lines learning everything, training their people, opening their stores for them, closing their stores for them in some cases. Um, and I took ownership of my job because anything I'm involved in, I'm going to take ownership of. And I, I understood that I was learning how to run a business. But I also understood that I was frustrated that it wasn't my business. So it just became time for that to shift and it just made sense. <clears throat> and I felt like I could do it because someone else was trusting me to do it. Like someone was paying me a handsome salary and giving me great benefits to do it for them and trusting me fully with a territory, you know? And so I can't do a brick and one brick and mortar, come on. You know, mm. it's like a lot of times when I do things and I step onto something else, the, the truth of it is that thing has fully prepared me for this thing. I was running Mac stores. I can't run a nail shop. Come on. Mm. You know, that business is doing two and a half million dollars a year. I can run a, I can run a nail shop. I'll be fine. Mm. Now, it was my business and I was in charge of every facet of it, but I figured that out. Like I had to figure out how to maintain, mainte maintenance a store. I had to figure out better bookkeeping capability. I had to figure out, you know, training. I didn't do these services, so I had to figure out a loophole with training, and I brought in the best people to train my team. But I knew marketing, I knew business, I knew sales teams, I knew sales, and I knew um, beauty. 
And so I, I had a lot of really good skill sets. So I, th I thought I was prepared. And maybe because the business was such a success immediately, right away I knew that I was onto something. I didn't have any appointments available for the first two weeks we opened. It was like, sorry, Kaylin, we'll have to see you next month. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's how it was. And so I realized that I had figured out something that I wanted and so many other women wanted it too. Because at the time I'm like living in Clinton Hill and I can't go anywhere that I like to get these services done except for Manhattan. And that's, that's not cool. You know, it's not cool then. It's not cool now. So I felt like I could appreciate this in my neighborhood. So I'll just do it. I'll do it in my neighborhood and then I'll have it in my neighborhood. That was the thinking. <clears throat> and then it just took off. And then I think early in that process, I learned, oh, I'm really good at marketing. This is not about these services at all. I'm just really good at conveying an idea to you about how I feel about this. And I learned that, I would say in my first year, that that's what I was strong at. I was very, very strong at that. And we had the best events. And we were booked. And our events booked out in five seconds. And... I remember one time we did a Groupon. It was the most successful Groupon in beauty ever. Just ever. Like Groupon called and was like, the hell? And I'm like, yeah, the hell. I can't even to manage this. But, you know, even that's an accomplishment. Like I think early on I was like, oh, I'm, I'm a marketing girl. Like I'm really good at that. And I started getting awards for marketing very, very early on in that, in that business. And that was a, those are things that I made up in my mind and I executed. And so I knew it was me. And I knew it was coming from me. And I was like, oh, that's, that's the thing I'm talented at. Okay. You know? Um, and it made sense. And so it was just like, how do we duplicate this to meet the demand in different areas? That, that was the plan. And it, now when I look back at how young I was when I was doing that, it sounds so crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you're young, you don't, you don't, I think when you're young, you don't doubt yourself as much, which is beautiful, you know? And then if you can, if you can be right about a few things... It, it builds it builds this confidence in you. Hmm. And then you start to feel like, hmm, I can probably pull off most things if I really buckle down and figure it out, you know? And I think I got there. I, hmm. I think I got there very early in my life. Hmm. Like, oh, if I really want to knock something out the box, I can. I just need to focus. Hmm. That's all. So I know that. It's so whether or not I want to do it, but I know it. Hmm. You know what? Let, let, let's, talk about, let's talk about marketing. Mm -hmm. um, if there's someone that was in, in your shoes, they were in the the 30 year old Trisha's shoes mm -hmm. of like, they, they have this idea, this business that they want to start. They have no, they, their vision is that they would love it in the first two weeks if they're booked out, you know, if they're literally telling people, oh, you have to, you know, you have to schedule for a month out. And so something that's interesting for me is I, I remember growing up, my dad always told me, focus on the fundamentals, not the sparkly stuff, not the glitzy stuff, not the special effects the fundamentals and the foundation. Yeah. And so when you think about marketing, and if you were to give advice to someone who's like, they're starting that business and they want to understand like, okay, how can I market this where there's a line around the corner, there's a line around the block when we open, what do you see as like those fundamentals of marketing? Learning it, really knowing it and understanding how it's special and unique and understanding its, its value add, mm. understanding... So I call, I think of marketing as just showing off something I love, right? So I feel like you've got to figure out what is it that you want to show off? Is it beautiful in here? Does it smell great? Is the music nostalgic? Are the services cute and named after cupcakes? Like, what is it about this place that's special? Do you have the best collection of polishes? You know, like, what is it? You have the best promotions? You have the best looking manage, front, front desk management team? Like, what about this is a great experience for people? Maybe it's just that every time you come in here, we call you by your name. You know, like, who knows? But you've got to figure out the product itself, and then you've got to figure out how to convey its uniqueness and its points of difference to the masses. Mm -hmm. And so I knew how my business was unique because I created it because nothing me met my need. So I was like, we are going to lead with hygiene, which was huge back then. Nothing now, but huge back then. You know, the week I closed, New York Times had this whole blow up. I don't know if it was the week or the year, but it was around the closing. New York Times had this huge blow up like story about the nail salon industry and how just filthy it was and how, you know, the work environment is horrible and the work hours are horrible and how 
nail technicians are working unbearable hours, making very little money. And it kind of like blew the lid off of the dark, dirty secrets of our industry that I already knew. But I knew it and I fought against it for 10 years. Mm. And I thought it was wrong. I thought it was wrong. Like my girls were salaried. They were paid, not salary, hourly. They were paid hourly. They clocked in, they clocked out. They were paid if they were at work. They were, you know, it was, and they they fought back with that because they'd never been paid hourly. They got a flat rate whether they were for the, there for six hours or 16 hours. I'm like, that's not a thing. Mm. You know, this is what's right. This is what's fair. And imagine trying to force onto people what is better and fair for them. That's That's how broken the industry was that I walked into. But I did what I thought was right, and I thought I did what I thought was fair, and then I found myself shifting the industry. So much so that as I'm closing up and New York Times is doing this massive expose, they're like, let's talk to an expert about the findings. Hmm. And I'm like, you don't want to talk to me. I've been screaming this for 10 years, and none of you guys cared. You know, like, I'll talk to you, but I've been saying this forever. Like, this is how the tools should be managed that are cutting into your skin. And, you know, like hygiene is important. Um, and again, that lesson comes up of like doing what is right, doing the best you can, regardless of what anyone else is doing. Because when I started my business and we had those practices in place, we would get cursed out for those things. And I'm like, we're literally following the New York state law. Hmm. But because no one else is, we're being picked on, we're being bullied, we're being complained about. People are going on, was it Yelp? And like, this is unacceptable. No, what you allow is unacceptable. This is the standard. And so now 10 years later, you know, when it is the standard, oh, she spearheaded the movement. Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. I did what was right. I didn't spearhead anything. You just didn't know what was right, you know, mm. and now you do. But you also are probably the person that was fussing at me, you know, then because I was doing what was right. So that, again, I'll always come back to this. You can't bother with people because where will they lead you? You know, you all would have had me out here doing pedicures in dirty water because mm -hmm. that's what everyone else was doing, you know. But I'm charging two bucks more so everything is hygienic, clean, bleached down to the T so that you can come in here safely and get your services and the whole place looks good, smells good, and is clean. And... Now you require that, but you didn't require that until I taught you that that was the requirement. That's the truth. And I think any of my clients would say that to you. She put that out there, and that was what the standard became. And we deserve the standard. We deserve the better standard. Um, but it doesn't mean that y'all didn't fight me for the first few years. It doesn't mean that. That's the truth, and that's the part that no one wants to talk about, mm -hmm. you know? So, again, you've got to just do your thing because what if I was like, oh, they're upset. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be following hygiene law, hygiene practices, hygiene policies because they're upset because no one else does. I should do what I think is right. I should do what I think is fair. I should do my best. And y'all will catch up. Or y'all won't catch up. That's fine, too. That's nothing of that has to do with me. Mm. But I know what I'm supposed to be doing here. And I'm going to do that, mm. you know? And that, that's just always going to be it for me. It really is. Because I've seen too many examples of following behind people, as my mom would say. You can't follow behind people. you got to just do you, right? And that comes up in everything. And real estate is the same. It's the same. I was ridiculed for how I approached real estate in the beginning. Hmm. And then, can we go to lunch? I'd love to pick your brain. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter if you want to pick my brain or if you're ridiculing me. I don't care about any of that because <laughs> literally it doesn't matter. I care that I'm doing what's right. I care that I'm doing a good job. I care that I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best. All the rest of that I can't care about because it shifts too much. Mm. It, just, it just changes too much because the more you know, the more educated you are, then the more informed you become. But I can't do what I do based on how informed you are. I got to do what I know is right. Mm. You'll catch up, or maybe you won't. I don't know, you know. But I hope you catch up. Hmm. Almost reminds me of what you said earlier when you said um, she told me no, but I told myself yes. Yeah. And it's almost like that's that's a core principle of marketing is knowing what your product is about, what separates you, what differentiates you, and then standing on it and being yeah. consistent in the face of adversity, criticism, yeah. people writing you off, not you know not liking the way that you do things. And I'm just curious, is there an experience that comes to mind where you, like, I, I feel like in, in any journey, 
when we're doing something difficult, we're on a mission. There's moments where we're like really tested. And usually it's funny, actually. One of the things I've realized, the moment when you're tested the most is usually just before you ascend. I know. And it's like one... And you one... cannot quit then. You've got to recognize that moment. It's only in hindsight, though, that you see it like that. I know, like but that. some of us let go. Some mm. of, I've, I've let go. Some of us let go. And it's just like, no, 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 just hang on. I promise you it's coming. When I speak to that, what, what is the experience that comes to mind where it was like you were so close to like, you know what, let's just mail it Screw in. this? Yeah, screw this. I think this. my first six or seven months in real estate where I just could not make a dollar, I was so frustrated. <laughs> I was like, I'm really good and I'm not doing this well. It must be the system that's broken, <laughs> you know, because I believed in myself, but mm. I had zero results. And I was like doing the same thing over and over. It just started to feel really insane to like get up every day and work that hard at something and nothing was working, mm. you know? And yeah. I, I always share the story of talking to my mom, like, I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. And she's like, just give it another month, Trisha. Just give it another month. I'm like, I want to flip this desk. I don't want to come in here no more. I'm tired of these people. I'm not doing it anymore because nothing was working. It was crazy. I was like doing, I was getting up every day at seven o'clock. I was getting into the office at seven. I was working, working, working. I was always on my computer. I gave myself carpal tunnel damn near. And I just couldn't get it done. I couldn't get anything done. I couldn't get a deal to come together. Mm. I just couldn't. So frustrated. And I remembered other times where I'd walked away from situations right before they were about to be in my favor, you know? Because I'm very much like that. Oh, no, I'm out of here. Like, I'm that girl. Like, this is not going to work for me. I'm done. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to listen to her advice and give it another month. But not even a month and a day, just a month. I was like, a month and that's it. Like, this, I feel crazy doing this because I come here every day and it does not do anything for me. It's just eating away from my day. And then I still have to leave here and go and run my salon. So this mm. is insane. Mm. <clears throat> I gave it another month. And that month was just, <laughs> that month was crazy. Mm. Everything came together that month. Mm. Everything. And, and then I had so many deals come together that month. When you say it was eating at you, like, like bring us closer. Like what, what was it that was happening that you were like, this just isn't working? I wasn't good. I wasn't good at it. And I was like, I'm good at everything. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> like my fiance is always like, you think you're good at everything? I was like, you kind of think I'm good at everything. And it's not like I think I'm good at everything, but I think I can figure out most things. You mm. know what I mean? Like I'm, I, I remember as a, as a kid, I would like sit in the mall and I'd watch, there was a salon called Tony and Guy and I'd watch them highlighting the girl's hair and they'd take this like aluminum foil and they'd put this like white cream on there and mm. they'd fold it. And then the girls would come out with highlights. So I'd watch that. And I'm like, I could do that shit. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd convince my friends to let me do it. <laughs> we were all bald one summer by me. <laughs> but you know what? I thought I could do it. I watched them do it, and I was like, I'm going to do it. And, you know, I don't know why I had friends that allowed me to, like, burn their bangs out or whatever, but I probably was confident. And I was like, girl, I know how to do that. And, yeah. and we all had blonde bangs for, like, three days, and then we had no bangs for three months. <laughs> but... I've always kind of had that little thing like, oh, I think I could figure, I think I could figure that out. You know mm. what I mean? Like if you left me in here, I tried to figure out how to do a podcast. That's just who I am. Yeah. And I'm like, I think I can, well, he kind of goes in with these, like I, I think I can do it. <laughs> it's just who I, I don't know what that comes from. But I think that it was like, how am I not good at this? I'm trying so hard. I'm working so hard and I really am not good at this. Nothing is working and nothing was working. And everyone was like, oh, you're not gonna make any money your first six months. I was like, Pfft. You won't make any money in your six months. Watch this. And then nothing happened. And I made no money. And I was just like, I don't understand. I'm working so hard mm. all the time, working, 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 working. And then that last month, that month I was going to quit was just like, it just flipped. Mm. It flipped. My seventh month in, seventh or sixth month in real estate, I was like top 10 mm. in the number one office at the number one firm. I was top 10. Seven months in, get out of here. Like, who does that? I did that. Again, that's why I know I can do things when I put my mind to it. Mm. You know? It might have been seven or six months in, and I was a top 10 agent in my office that I had chosen to go to because it was the number one firm and the number one office in Brooklyn. And now I'm in the top 10, and I'm one of the number ones there. And I literally have been in the business for eight months, seven months, maybe six. It was seven months probably. Mm. Like, yeah, it is what it is. You know, so so you start doing, and you know, give me the give me the context on it because you make this decision that you're gonna close down these salons, become a real estate agent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I did both. Th I did this. I did this. I was a real estate agent while I had the salons, and then I got to a point where I had to pick one because I couldn't sustain any of that anymore. Mm -hmm. I was I'm, I was like on 
I had nothing left. I was just, I was working all the time. So in that period when you were working both, if I was just to like observe your life on the day to day, like like what would I have seen? Like what was even a typical day for you oh, in insane. that moment? So I was uh, getting up at like five thirty six in the morning, <clears throat> and I would go to the park and I would exercise. And I think I had a trainer from Blink at the time, but I'd get back home and I'd be ready to work around eight thirty, and I would um, I would work real estate. And then around 12 o'clock, I'd go into the salons. And then if it was an office day, which most of the weekdays were office days, like at least three days, four days of the week, I'd go into the office. Um, then I would not work out with the trainer. I would go directly to the office at 7 a.m. because I tried to be the first person in the office. Because if you are the first person in the office, it's very quiet and you get to listen in on conversations. And so you're only listening on half of the conversation, but you still are learning a lot. And there was a woman that sat across from me. She was a real estate lawyer turned real estate agent. And the ability to listen to her conversations early in the morning without disruption disruption at all was the best gift I could have gotten. I don't remember her name till this day, but I would listen to her conversations. And she was so confident and so smart and so savvy because she knew the law and she knew the sales. And she was a phenomenal agent. And I used to go in there probably more than anything to listen to her conversations because I, you get to figure out what she's talking about. Because I'm dealing with deals, but I'm learning from her and she has no idea. <clears throat> and I would do that. So 7 o'clock, and then like around maybe 1 or 2 o'clock, sometimes 3 o'clock, I would leave and go to one of the salons. And then the next day, the same routine, but the other salon. And so that was my routine. And the weekends, a salon. And I had wonderful managers that would really manage the salons really well. So I was kind of like a little bit pulled out of the stores, but still working on all of the marketing. And um, really, really hyper-focused on real estate, because I knew I wanted to do that. I knew that that was, one, that was my next thing. It was just a matter of like figuring out how all this was going to come together and come to a close. <clears throat> I didn't want to do both. I wanted to, I wanted to rebuild. I wanted to restart, you know. Um, and so the days were long. I had an agent. There was a young agent in our Williamsburg office, and she was like one of the top. I think she was the top Brooklyn agent. And I'd covered an open house for her, and she absolutely loved the way I covered the open house and the notes I sent her and the way I left the home and, you know, my effect, what I do and how I do it. And she was like, I don't know who you are, but you can cover anything I got. And I said, great. And so every Sunday I covered a bunch of her properties for a year. And I would cover her properties and just meaning like they're her properties, but I'm going to show them to you. And then I would learn like all the questions the clients would ask. And I would learn the, the, the challenges that they would give. And then she'd show up sometimes and she'd have like some notes or whatever. I wasn't on her team and I wasn't working with her, but I got to work with these amazing properties. And I got to show and I got to meet all the buyers in the properties. And so I had a chance to, like, if they weren't going to buy that house, I could work with them to buy another house. And so that was the hope to always be able to pick up a buyer. And I did that for a year and I did it every single weekend except for, I think, Thanksgiving weekend. Maybe Christmas weekend too, but definitely Thanksgiving weekend. I remember it being the first weekend that I had off, hmm. you know, for like six months. Um, and that gave me really, really expedited experience in what it is that we do as real estate agents, because this, this woman had like 40 properties at a time. <clears throat> so I got to learn really quickly with her. And I did that for the first year, I always covered her properties. And so, you know, my first year I did like, I don't even know, like hundreds of open houses and no other opportunity would have created that for me. But because she had so, many invent so much inventory and she trusted me to show in her absence, I got to show a bunch of properties every weekend. And so it's like every month I'm getting better and I'm getting better. And one thing I know how to do is sell. I'll sell anything to anybody anywhere. I'll sell this whole place to you right now. I'll sell you. I'll sell it with us sitting in here. That's what I will do. I love selling. Like I, I do that with, with, I just, as I breathe, I sell. That's just what I am. So I, I got so excited about like learning so quickly. It was like really exciting for me. And that's really what kind of lit a fire under me because it was like, it felt active. It felt like I was moving forward and I wasn't closing deals, but I felt like I was moving forward. And that just felt really good, you mm -hmm. know, to, to feel like I know more this week than I knew last week. And that was enough for me to hang on to until I started doing my own deals. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like what my process was my first year. And it was really, really hard. I cried a lot. I cried a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I, I think that people should know that, you know, you do cry a lot because it's weird like to be working on something that much and it's not working and it won't work. It just won't work because people have to trust you with their asset, their biggest asset in the world. Sometimes they have to trust you and you can only build that trust through education, knowledge and expertise and some confidence. But the confidence comes with the three things I just mentioned. Hmm. You know, the confidence doesn't 
bring you the other three things. Like, the confidence comes with those things. Mm. So I just did that, and I did that for a year. And then once I realized that it was working, and more importantly, once I realized that my beauty clients automatically wanted to work with me because I had built a reputation in Brooklyn for how I did things with those women. And so whether it was, you know, a manicure or their home, they they trusted me. They trusted they trusted my ability to do a job and get it done and get it done right. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what? You have um it's interesting listening to you speak about that because um about 18 months ago is when I left my job to do this podcast full time. And the first year, you know, what? actually, when we had our first conversation, I was like very much in the midst of that first year. And I remember so many occasions, I wasn't crying a lot. <laughs> it's okay if you were, you know, yeah. I wouldn't judge you. <laughs> I, I wasn't crying a lot. But I had so many nights when I was at my mom's house in New Jersey. And I would just be like, I don't... Like I was working so hard and exactly what you said is true, which is like you're trying all of these different things and they're not working. And it's not that you're doing the same thing. You're actually learning from mistakes. You're coming back, getting better, trying something else. That doesn't work. Back to the drawing board. And you're, you're working the hardest you ever have with the least results you've ever got it's in your insane. life. It's insane. That's why I wanted to flip my desk because <laughs> it doesn't feel good. And you know what, that I, there was like, there's so many points in that process where like your mind always goes somewhere where it's like, it's like dark almost, like it's just, it's just difficult. And I think there was, there tends to be, I feel like those are the moments when you really kind of learn about yourself yeah, and who you are. But entrepreneurism, will, entrepreneurism will continue to teach you who you are. It'll continue to give you life lessons. Like, that's what I kind of love about it. Because as much as I develop those skills, they have to show up in my life. The ability to not be good at something and get over it and keep trying. You know what I mean? Like that. Not see the results you want to see right away, but believe it's going to come. Walk into a space and command. You know, all these things that you're learning about yourself. Like, who are you when shit's not going right? Like, who are you? Like, I know who I am when everything's going right. I think everyone knows who I am when everything's <laughs> going right. But who are you when nothing is going right? That's the true work. And I think that entrepreneurism is, entrepreneurism is really beautiful in the sense that the more, the more it develops me, the better I become at it. But it definitely has to develop me first, you know? And I'm always learning and I'm always, I'm just developing all the time. Like... Even in this last year, I've learned my power and the ability to bring people together and to act right and, belong, and behave. Like, I've learned that. Mm. I'm like, oh, I'm very powerful in that way. Like, I can get people to realize you don't have to agree with her, and she definitely doesn't have to agree with you, but we need to win today. So let's everybody get their act together. Let's keep it moving, right? Like, I didn't know I was that person, I, but I, I am. And so I'm like, oh, look at that little skill I just developed, you know? You're, you're just, you're never not going to be getting better. You're just never not going to be getting better. Because I feel, I mean, I've been an entrepreneur for, <clears throat> since 17 years, I think. Mm. 17 years. And I get better at it every, every, every day I get better at it. But definitely I, I can look back and be like, I'm so glad that this is where I'm at now. Like I definitely bounce back from disappointment so much faster now than I used to, you know, like I used to be like, God damn it. You know, this is, this is not right. You know, whereas now I'm just kind of like, what is next? Let's go. Like Mm. I'm far more likely to blink and move on now than before. Mm. Um, And those are the things that you take with you. Those, those are the things, the ability to fail and fail fast, the ability to be wrong, the ability to say you don't know and ask for help, you know, the ability to hold your composure and be your best self when everything's falling apart. Like, those are the things that you're getting out of it. I'm getting out of it. And I think that that just sets us up to really fly, mm. you know, I think, because it's like, you're not going to break me. I'm gonna break you. You're not gonna break me. Like, mm. and a lot of things try to break you in this world. A lot of people try to break you in this world. You know, I've, 
I've had people close to me come to me and be like, well, you know, you're a beauty girl. Did you ever think that maybe no one will take you seriously in real estate? What do you think now? Hmm. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you think anyone's going to take me seriously? Hmm. I feel like they've taken me seriously. And the nerve of someone to ask me that, right? Hmm. That's what entrepreneurism gives you, is the ability to just figure out who you are as a person, I think. Hmm. It's been the gift I've received, at least. It's, it's definitely the biggest gift I've received. It's like, because there's so many times where all you have is you. Especially those early days where no one believes in you at all. Like, that's, <laughs> that's a tough time. A podcast? You better go to your job and get yourself, you know, get, get to work, you know? Yeah. Uh, I remember, like, telling my friend, I always tell this story where I remember telling my friend Camille, who was my client. I sold her house twice, maybe? I think I sold her house twice. But I remember running into her on the train, and I was like, I'm quitting my job today. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to open my own business. And I remember the doors closing. And I always want to ask Camille, did this happen or did I make it up in my head? But I remember the train doors closing and her being like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Don't go in there and quit your job, you know? Um, and then, you know, she becomes a loyal beauty client. And then I sell her apartment, you know, like it's, and I don't know what's next for me, but I think she'll be a customer then too. Mm. <laughs> I know she'll be watching Owning Manhattan, you know, like it's, it's just doing it, believing in it and letting them catch on. Mm. You know what, you mentioned that those first kind of six months in real estate were so difficult. And you talk about the story of, of going to your mom and like just sharing the frustration and telling her like, you know, I want to flip the fucking desk, like I'm, I'm over it. I'm curious, what is the, you come out of that and in that first year you sell $14.6 million of real estate, you win rookie of the year at the company, the brokerage that you're at. I'm curious, what was that, what was that first feeling after that difficult six months where it was like, that was the big win? Because I think, I think for, for every entrepreneur, we remember that where it was like, it was almost like we were slogging through the mud like deep mud, like it feels like we're in right, deep waters. Right, right. And then there's that first experience where it felt like you you almost breathed in oxygen. Like you got that yeah. air of like yeah. finally a win. Yeah. Um I think I was going through a period of time where I knew I, I knew I looked like I had lost my mind because my business was very successful, but I was very miserable. And <clears throat> I knew to some people I looked like I was failing. I knew to some people in real estate I looked like, oh, here she comes. Everybody want to be in real estate, but nobody really wants to be in real estate because everybody gets their license and you never hear about it again. And I felt like when I had that, it was about a week, a week that happened where just like, I don't know, like this went into contract, this went into contract, this offer got accepted, this, 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 this. and it was... It was just insane. It was like, I don't even remember how many deals it was. Um, but everything came together very quickly, which happens a lot for me. Like, I'm definitely the girl that'll have nothing and then everything falls in my lap at the same time. Like, I just have accepted that that's sometimes going to be my story. But that's what happened there. And um, honestly, I felt pissed that I didn't remember who the fuck I was. Mm. How dare you? You saw what you just did with this beauty business. How, the, how could you... I remember being like, how could you let this nonsense throw you and, 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 not, and you not remember who you are? You built a business from fucking scratch and dust that people are clamoring for in a city you don't own and you don't have any support and you don't know anybody. And you can't walk down the street without people knowing your business because you did that shit. How dare you, you let real estate confuse you? You know who you are. So I remember being pissed that I went through that period of doubting myself. Like, are you kidding me? That's what you do. Mm. And I think it needed to happen because I had to go through that process of knowing what it's like to learn something and not be good at something again. Like, and so... Now I'm not as afraid to step into things when I don't know and I'm not clear and I'm not good because I'm like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do well. I'll, I just got to figure it out. I just got to figure it out. That's all. Whereas I think then I was like, hmm, can I still learn? Like, can I, 
can I, you know, and it's, I, I just doubted that. And maybe it's because it was such a big jump because I'd only thought I was a beauty girl. And I didn't think I could do anything else. Like I always thought I was going to, I thought I was going to do beauty for the rest of my life. And I didn't see anything else for myself. I didn't see that um, I could love anything else or enjoy anything else. Um, so maybe when it wasn't working, it just made sense to think that I was not good at it and I couldn't do, I couldn't be good at it. Um, and I remember being pissed that I would l doubt myself in that way. Hmm. I, it was just very off brand. Like, don't doubt, don't doubt yourself. You know, you know, you can do what you need to do when you need to do it. Don't allow these little fumbles here to, th to, you know, let you forget who you are. Um, and it was such a good thing for me because it was like, now my job is to share the success and to share the accomplishments as a way of marketing myself as a certified real estate agent and a real deal real estate agent. And in doing that and in marketing my capabilities and being like, like I remember one day I really wasn't sharing a lot about real estate and then I'm like, I'm gonna break the fucking internet. And I just like posted all my closings. It was like 15 closings, just some crazy shit like that. My first year I sold 21 properties. So the first time I posted about selling anything, it was like, I just closed these nine properties or whatever it was, you know? And I remember sharing that because I never was sharing at the time. I guess maybe I didn't want everybody to know that I was doing a bunch of stuff or maybe because I wasn't good. I couldn't share. I don't know. Probably all ego. Who knows what it was? But not a lot of people knew. And I remember like sharing it for the first time. And everybody was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean you sold all these houses? I don't know if it was nine houses or 11. It was some ridiculous amount of houses. And um, I just remember feeling like, you know, you have this in you. You just mm. had to figure it out. Like, don't don't get all psyched out about it. Like, you know you can do this, you know? Um, I don't know that I've had that happen since then, but I remember it happening and I remember being like, never again, never again. Like, no, I, I will never allow a circumstance to tell me who I am. I just gotta figure my way out here, that's all, mm. you know? I was pissed that I let that happen. Because you're coming off of building a super successful business in New York City. I moved here with less than $100. So that's a pretty big accomplishment mm. to be able to do that, you know? And it's okay to stand on that, mm. no matter how uncomfortable it makes anyone else. I did that. Mm. It's just interesting because I can, um, I feel like in life it's like, Sometimes you need to learn the same lesson like multiple yeah. times. Yeah. Like the context, the context needs to change. And I even think about the example that you gave earlier where it's like you're the one black girl in like a room full of 300 people. And, you know, even even in our prior conversations, we were talking about um, promoting yourself, sometimes feeling like this level of guilt or like this... Um, almost like an embarrassment of like sharing what you've done. Like it feels yeah. so difficult yeah. and, it, and it brings me back to almost thinking about that room. And it's like the one black girl that puts her hands up and says, I actually did all of these things. Yeah. And it's like, it feels so difficult <clears throat> to do that, to stand out. And yeah. it was like, you were fighting all of those. Yeah. And I think that it's, that's something that resonates with a lot of new real estate agents because real estate is a, is a role in which you need to be comfortable saying I did this and I did it well because it is you, like you, you sold that or you didn't sell it or you negotiated that or you didn't, you know? And that was hard for me to get used to because I had such comfort with putting my brand forward and my business forward because I felt like it was a detached from me. It was like, it wasn't me, it was Polish Bar. And I did really well with showing off Polish Bar. But now I have to show off me mm -hmm. and what I've done and what I've accomplished. And I struggled with that for a little bit, not a lot of it, just a little bit. And I definitely had two people in my life that were like, get over yourself. Like, nobody cares. <laughs> mm -hmm. You'll be fine. And I did. And I did instantaneously. Like, I remember having a conversation with um, Jeff about it. And then a friend of mine, my leak Teal, that's in Atlanta. And then the same day or week, they both were like, girl, nobody's paying you that much attention. You'll be fine. Like, get over yourself. Put yourself out there. Put your work out there. Stand on what you do and continue to do so. And um, I did. And people responded really, really well to it. And people came out of the woodworks like, oh, this is what you're doing now? Okay, I guess I got to, I guess I got to really, you know, fire my real estate agent. And I'm like, I guess you do, you know, and they, they received it so well. And the client, 
the phone has always rung, you know, it, it just always rang. Like, it, it's just like, I did the work in that business and it benefits me in this business. Hmm. You know, the foundation was built over there though. I still have the foundation. But I worked out those kinks in beauty and then brokerage benefited from me working out those kinks in my first career. And I think that's the true for so many people that have been able to find success in other, in other rooms and then decide to make a pivot. You're still that person that did that. Take all you learn, take your, pick everything up and bring it over here, you know? Hmm. Whatever it is. Because greatness translates, you know? Mm -hmm. It just does. You know, like nail salon? New York City real estate? Hmm. Make it make sense, you know? Or you can be like, I did make it make sense. It makes total sense. Look hmm. at it. Servicing customers. A lot of times women. Selling beauty. Selling the city that I love, you know? Selling uh, aesthetic. And using your power to negotiate and, and support and win for your client you know it's, it's it's very similar a lot of the stuff is very similar i mm. think you know yeah it's just picking up those tools and realizing how you can use them in the next room that's all yeah yeah you know what? if we fast forward to now so you sold over 300 million dollars of real estate you now have this show coming out on netflix owning manhattan and you're one of the stars of it i'm curious like what's the challenge now like what's the even, um, I remember one of the things that you mentioned when we spoke, you said like, even this past year has been one of the most difficult. Like yeah. what, what's, the, what's difficult for Trisha Lee now? Well, I think the last year was difficult because I had to figure out how to be a real estate agent that's also being a real estate agent on TV, you know, and that was, that was difficult. Um, Why? Because I put a lot of pressure on myself to do really well with things. I'm not here to just do shit. I'm here to do it well. Mm. So that added pressure makes it harder, you know, but I won't change that. I won't. Did you, were there points when you were even filming where you felt like I'm not doing this well? Yeah, I definitely felt that. And I think early on, um, they want a real story. They want, they want a real person. They want you. They want, they want to know what your days and your life is, are like. And I got into my head and I felt like, well, I'm not just here to be Trisha. I'm here to be representation of every th woman that looks like Trisha. And I made that this huge like burden of a backpack that I had to walk around with on set and like think about everything that came out of my mouth and how it would be perceived and how it would impact and how it would look. And that is so exhausting to explain, more or less to go through every day. Mm -hmm. And I had wonderful people around me that were like, we just want you to be you. We just want you to be you. That's it. There's no boring version of you. There's no excitable version of you. We just want you to be you. And I decided a few weeks in that I'm a boss and I'm a boss and I'm a boss. And if I'm a boss, that means I'm going to walk in here and I'm going to be myself. And I don't care what you think about me walking in here being myself. I just had to step into that power of like, I'm going to be me. I'm going to be me. And... I had to take off that burden of like, well, if I do this, they're going to think that every black woman, let them think it. Let them think it. Like, they think what they want to think anyways. Everybody thinks what they want to think. Like, why would I think that I, Trisha Lee, have to fix that narrative? I don't have to fix anything. I have to just be true to myself and be good to myself. That's what I have to do. And so once I just like got out of my head, then it became fun. It just became fun. It was just like, yeah, you guys need to really see what this work is like, what these crazy people are like, what these crazy, you know, coworkers of mine are like. My colleagues are crazy. I mean, I think they'd say the same thing about me, but <laughs> <laughs> everyone is right. Yeah. <laughs> everyone is accurate. And I just had to figure it out. Um, and it was exciting to be figuring it out and to be learning something new again. And I wasn't resentful about learning something new in the way that I was when I went to real estate. I was like, I'm not good at this. And I don't understand. And it was like, no, I was just struggling and I was just struggling and I was kind of laughing at myself. And I was like, oh, you know, whatever, whatever. And I was like, girl, you know what? Take all this pressure off. Just be you. And I had great, great people around me. The producers were just like, we think you're great. Just be you. It's like this, what you're giving us now, just do that. And then once I just understood that that's all I needed to do, like it was really just that simple, you know, just 
then the cameras weren't there, and then I can't be responsible for anything that happened because the cameras were there, and I just, I just never paid attention to them. They weren't intimidating anymore. Hmm. You know? So mindset is everything. Because it was the same crew. It was the same amount of cameras. It was the same amount of documentary. But um, the mindset changed. Hmm. And then I felt very free doing it. And then I feel like now that I want to be such a boss that I can be my full self and show who I truly am and just put it out there. And that's okay. And that's enough. Like, I don't need to be responsible for how you perceive it. I don't need to be responsible for how it makes you feel. I don't need any of that. I can just put it, just, I can just be me and be okay with you liking it or loving it or hating it or, you know, being inspired by it, being infuriated by it. whatever it does for you, like God bless. But I, I just want to be myself and I want to put it out there. That's mm. all. Like, that's my responsibility now. That's what I think, mm. you know? You, you know what you know what's interesting i think when you're when you're someone that's like deeply ambitious and you have this desire to outperform it's like you have to obsessively care about every detail and everything in your work and at the same time have this ability to let go, let go. and it's such it's like it's in conflict it's so difficult every moment all the time like you know it's 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 always that it's always that or know what you want to be you know really detailed about and, and also, like, know that what really matters, you know? Mm. But I had to get there, and I had to get there quickly because I was messing up, and I had to figure out what do you want to do? And it's just like, well, maybe just put who I am out there to the world properly, accurately. Maybe I'll just do that. And then maybe that will just be a lot easier than worrying about how the world takes it, mm. you know? And that's a commitment you make to yourself. And even that's growth and development. You know, because I had to figure that out mm. and how wonderful it is that I was able to figure that out in this last year. And it's carried on over into so many other areas of my life, mm. you know, that even when I don't have the biggest transactions, the biggest numbers, you know, this last year has been spent, last two years has been felt spent filming a show. So I've had a lot of time and a lot of work time dedicated to that and all that comes with that. And so the performance is not what it typically is. And that's okay, too. I still know who I am and what I'm capable of. And that's all that matters. Mm. You know? You know what? Here, here, here's where I want to end. Um, I've been seeing on your Instagram, obviously, like the, the premiere, everything that's been happening around, around the release of this show. And, you know, what? we've been speaking for, for nearly two hours. And right in the beginning you kind of give me the context of like the little girl that's growing up um in arizona the only black girl in her class a uh, single mom with your sister and you compare that reality to having a netflix show where there's going to be millions and millions of eyeballs on that i'm just curious like how you how you reconcile that and how you even feel like if that six-year-old version of Trisha was to see what you're doing now and to see where you are and some of the platforms and some of the accolades, just what would she think? I think she would think this makes perfect sense. I think she would think, oh, yeah, there it is. I really do. Like, there are huge parts of my personality that feels that all of this is right on time and makes perfect sense. So it's like divinely orchestrated. Like build up her confidence, build up her belief in herself, build up her ability to look at details that no one else is paying attention to, build up her ability to negotiate, build, build up her ability to walk tall even though she's five fucking two. Build her up through these experiences so when she gets there, she feels like she's supposed to be there more than anyone else because no one else thinks she's supposed to be there. So it's imperative that she believes she belongs there. And... I do believe my six-year-old self would be like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's, I can see that for her. And she's going to kill that shit, too. I really believe that. And I think anyone who knows me believes that, too. If you, if you truly, truly know me, you would say that. Like, I don't wake up ever without getting a message of, like, this makes perfect sense. Oh, my God. This is, like, finally, you know, like, you belong here. Like, that's what I hear every day. Every single day. I was coming over and I got a text message from one of my sorority sisters that was like, this makes perfect sense, Trisha. Like this, 
I want the world to see who you are because we've got to, we, we know who you are. I want the world to see who you are. So I think my six-year-old self would be like, yeah, it all made sense. It all, it all was for a really good purpose. Um, and the responsibility of that to me is to share the truth so that other women like myself understand that they're not alone in the moments of doubt, frustration, wanting to flip their desk, being afraid of learning something new, forgetting who they are and having to remind themselves that they're a badass. Like I think that if I'm truthful about all of those moods and moments and feelings and failures, then I will reinforce something in other black girls like myself and six-year-old versions of myself that is needed that we can do and be all these things, even if the start is not the same, even if the hand is a little shitty, you know? Mm. Um, even if we don't get the, the perfect setup, because I should not be here doing any of these things. If my truth, truthful experiences are ever shared and told, you would be like, okay, she should definitely be at a, in a bench somewhere in a park talking to herself, a deep conversation and arguing. Like that's where she should be because her experiences also have prepared her for that. Mm. But I think that the fight and the fire that's just in you sometimes, hopefully, if you can find it, you know, um, will pull you out of those dark places and those tough moments and those doubtful moments. And um, you just have to keep believing in yourself because that's that was my shit. I had to when no one did. I remember opening my second store and I was packed at my first store. And I'm opening my second store and I remember feeling like I could not share it with my family members because I didn't want to stress them out. Because I had already quit my job, I had already opened a business, and now you're gonna open a second business? And I came from an environment where that just wasn't a thing. People worked their jobs until they retired from their jobs. What are you doing? gonna be all stressed out and then all their stress is gonna be projected on me and that's gonna be more stressed out and that's been a lot of the way I've gone about things is to not share things because I'm like I don't need you projecting your bullshit on me I got my own bullshit I gotta carry I got my own stress and fear around this I gotta figure this out why would I tell you about it and then listen to your fears about it so I would hope that not just black women but I would hope that black women see me and know the truth or hear the truth or, or come to understand the truth and just see how we are all, all the same in that way. We're all like fighting demons and fighting back and building and getting up every day and fighting for this good life. Like every day we get, I get up and fight for my health. Every day I get up and fight for my happiness. Every day I get up and fight for my clients, my business, my family, my life. Every day I do it. And I don't want to do it sometimes, but every day I do it, you know? I don't have a choice because I know I want a good life. And I know that only me and only Trisha Lee can make that happen. Um, so I would hope that someone will see these stories and say, well, she's just like me. She's got a lot of shit on her plate too. And look at, you know, she's just, you, I am just like you. I am absolutely just like you. Absolutely. Hmm. You know, but there's a fire there. I just, got, I just got to keep it going, you know? That, that's, that's the one thing I just got to, I just got to always figure out every day is how to keep that fire there. Mm. I love it. Yeah. Trisha Lee, thank you so much. You're welcome. Absolutely. That was, that was amazing. I love it. <laughs> how do we do on time? Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. It's really a dream for me that I get to do this. It's surreal that this is what I do full time and every week. So if you enjoy the content, if you enjoy the conversation, the stories, please hit that subscribe button. It helps us immeasurably with growing the channel, with getting guests, all of those things. So please hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next time.